First Peter 5.5. 5. Let's turn our Bibles there. Um, we've been going through, and actually we talked about in uh, 3 John uh, chapter 2. It said, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in every way, that your, uh, that your body may keep well, even as I know your soul keeps well and prospers. So we're already on knowing that in order for even our body to move ahead and be healthy, and our soul needs to prosper. We need to have that happen. So we began to kind of uh, research that. Our soul is our mind, our will, and emotions. It's the area we're able to choose with. So it's really important that that's the area that prospers. Yeah? yeah. Our spirit has already made a new creature. We just got to get that over into this. And the prosperity that he puts us when we say, Lord, come into my life. Let your kingdom come in and set up in my heart. This is where the, the Bible says the deepest part of your heart is right here. Your spirit's located. That's why when you get convicted, it goes uh, right there. It doesn't do that in your earlobe. It does it right here because the deepest part of your heart is right there. And, and when we're able to, to sense that, what ends up happening is the poverty that's going on in our soul that he's convicting us about. Now the spirit is saying, I want to bring prosperity to that area. Yeah, that's right. It's not, now this is how we see it. Oh man, I just got in trouble. <laughs> that's why we don't invite conviction. We just don't because our poverty way of thinking like, I'm not getting in trouble for this one. No, you're not telling me. I wasn't my fault. And it's, it's a defensive area and it will try to defend itself out of the, its poverty. But if we invite conviction and we say, what we're really saying, spirit of the living God, blow through this soul yeah. who and all of a sudden it, it he does and there's an awareness of like i'm thinking wrong in this area you get that like eh. like oh man i just got convicted you're not in trouble he wants to prosper you yeah. Better you. Yeah. Amen. see if we just change the way we look at it and be able to go bring it on lord bring it convict and convict me good intensely I do not want to miss this one because I want to prosper. Yeah. But most people don't look at it like that. We look at it like, let's try to get it right so we don't get convicted on anything. Let's try to, we got to get it, ooh, we really got to watch our P's and Q's or whatever. And it's like, no, I already know I'm going to get it wrong. Nine out of ten things most of the time, right? So I can glory in the one thing that I pulled off, but there's going to be a whole lot of stuff that I just don't think like the Lord. Yeah. And I want to be convicted. So poverty has a training that says, um, but then that means you're outside. You're, you don't belong anymore. You're in trouble. Go to your room. Yeah. <laughs> I always bring this up when I teach parenting class. I'm not a big fan of go to your room. Unless you're going to your room to wait for me. <laughs> or to wait for him. Because if you're in your room, we're just trying to separate you away for a little bit because we're going to come in there and talk to you by yourself. But we don't, we, I don't like the, go to your room. And the kid stomps off and, you know, and then they're in there playing video games or whatever. Ooh, this is the big punishment. Wow, I'm really uptight now, you know, whatever. But what it says is, get out of my face is another one. Get out of my face. Go to your room. Be away. So this is what we hear many times because our training is, I just got convicted. Be removed. When God is saying, I want to convict you, come here. Come here, because you get into my presence, it's going to prosper that poverty in your soul. Yes. That's right. Amen. Yeah. I'm going to overtake you with the blessing. You're going to think like I think. Yeah. Yes. Woo! Yeah. So the soul is the place of choice, and what we do is out of fear, when there's poverty, we'll just go, I, I want to hear from him, but I don't really, but oh, I don't know if I'm hearing God, I don't know, and there's this whole confusion thing that comes there because we just haven't let our guard down and just gone... Just tell me what it is, God. Yeah. Convict the crowd out of me. Just do it. <laughs> I mean, bring it. Bring it on. I got to be messed up in something here. And, uh, you know, and sometimes I'll come before him like that. I'm pretty convinced that I'm doing something off. And he affirms me. And it's a surprise. I'm like, really? And then I'll go and I'll research. And I'll find out about different things. I'll get knowledge on it. And it's like, oh, I wasn't as off as what I thought I was. But there's something about that humbling ourselves to get that prosperity. Yeah. Yeah. It's not a thing, right? It's him. Yeah. We're embracing him and his presence. 
All right, so uh, your knowledge base, you know, where we have our, our mind, will, and emo emotions, our will makes the choice. Our knowledge um, can tie into um, just how we make the choice, and then our, our emotional base is supposed to support all that, and that is usually kind of a mess. <laughs> I mean, if we could get our emotions together most of the time, um, that would be that area that would just give us clearance and we'd just run the race even harder, but it's our emotions that need to prosper. Yeah. They need to be silenced in certain areas and they need to come up and feel in certain areas and prosperity will do that. So you have to have the knowledge from the word to get that to happen. But what ends up happening is sin has touched us all. We've either participated in it or it's happened to us. And what it's done is it's deposited uh, that, that feeling of like, oh no, fear. And that's the thing that's subtracted from us that causes us to be in lack. And when you have lack, you fear more lack. And you have lack thinking. Then you start thinking lack's coming more and there's more lack. And I don't know, and this happened to me before, it'll probably happen again, I'm not sure what's gonna happen next. All of that starts going down the line. And when we become born again, and we become, like we said, new creatures in Christ. Uh, we're a new creation is the better way that I like to say because I'm like I've said before, whenever I say creature, I always think of some sci-fi thing. I'm a new creature, you know, I don't know, but it's, that's, that's just me, and so I have to go over to now I'm a new creation. <laughs> Pretty sure on my worst days I look like a creature, but you know, on my best days I'm a new creation. That's, that's where God is operating. And uh, so he wants us to, to move over into that. He's deposited prosperity right here in us. Yes, yes. When we say, God, forgive our sins. Yes. He sent the sin away and they said, come into my life. Yes. He set up his kingdom and his kingdom is total prosperity. Yes. Amen. He wants to prosper us in all things at all ways at all times. Yes. He doesn't know how to be lack. So how do you bring him and, and, and think he's going to bring lack when he, there's no lack in him? Yeah? yeah. So he's going to come in and he's going to bring that. The first area he's going to want to bring that in right here is when he sets up his kingdom here. And then that overflow is going to go right up into our soul, our mind, our will, and emotions. And it's going to be touched by God and prosperity will come. And it will challenge every area of lack that you've ever had, every area that you've been subtracted from. It'll challenge that. It'll almost feel tormenting. So how can that be the blessing? Because our idea of the blessing is just kind of how you picture if you won the lottery. All the emotion, you know, you know those sweepstakes things you see the commercial or whatever where they come up and they're like, knock on the door and it's like, you've just won. You know, we picture prosperity. We'll always have that feeling of like, yay, you know, we just got the big check and we're standing there getting our picture taken. Yay, it's great. Well, even in those services where God moves on us the most, and it kind of feels like that, you leave, you go, yeah, that was awesome. That's when prosperity just came over onto you. And all of a sudden, your soul and prosperity are going to have a talk. Yeah. All the rest of that week, that's where people will say, I left that service and I just was so pumped and I felt so good and whatever. Yeah, because you just got the check. Now how are you going to spend it? What area of your poverty is that going to be divvied out to? See, then it goes, ugh. <laughs> oh my goodness, we're going to have to do this. So one of the things that we talked about is how it says in the Amplified, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5, is, uh, I had to go get me an apron here, um, because it says, likewise, uh, well, I'll just go down to that. It's about halfway through verse 5 and just jump into it because we've talked about the other parts before. It says it like this. It says, clothe yourself, but it says, clothe or apron yourself, all of you, with humility as the garb of a servant so that its covering cannot possibly be stripped from you with freedom from pride and arrogance toward one another. For God sets himself against the proud, the insolent, the overbearing, the disdained, full, the presumptuous, the boastful, and he's just given some examples. He could probably go on. And he opposes, frustrates, and defeats them, but gives grace, favor, blessing to the humble. So now when we're looking at this, he's asking us to apron ourselves with humility. And humility is a supernatural thing. So we have to go, okay, so by faith, I'm going to do something that's going to put this apron on. Just the same way when he says uh, to clothe ourselves with the armor. We have to take that by faith. We have to go, I am putting on salvation today. That's what I'm doing. I'm going to think salvation thoughts by the word. 
My heart is covered by his righteousness. I am under the blood of Jesus. And so we put that on and we do that, but then there's a walking out of that. And part of why we apron ourselves with humility is what he said is so that we can serve. Yeah. Right? There's something about serving. Yeah. Susan, would you mind coming up here and let me apron you? I'll put some humility on her. <laughs> it would be nice if it worked that way. Just like, could I have it? And you just put it on. And... But the thought is that she comes and, and uh, you know, you can leave it hang like that. But it doesn't say to do it that way. It says that when you put it on, it's like your intention is, you know, I don't want to have to tie this thing again. Right? So you're going to put a good knot or something in it. Make sure that it's tight because you're, you're, it's aproned on you. And your attitude then is to serve. I'll have you stand here a little uncomfortable for a little bit because she's serving right now, right? So if there's any poverty in her, it'll automatically come up just because she's serving. Right here, right now. Um, clothe apron yourselves, all of you, with humility as the garb of a servant so that its covering cannot possibly be stripped from you with freedom from pride and arrogance, and it goes on in that. So, so in order to keep that apron on, we have to have set ourselves as a servant. Mm -hmm. So when you set yourself as a servant, when she put it on, her intention is not like, if she didn't tie it in the back, it'd be like, well, we'll see what I do. Maybe I'll spend an hour here and I'll serve. Then I'm going back to doing other things. You know, the intention isn't like, no, this is, I, it's on, it's gonna stay. When she's aproned in like that, her attitude is, I am gonna serve no matter what. Yeah. Because humility needs to be there no matter what. And in order to keep humility moving, we're in that servanthood realm, right? Yeah. And so they kind of go together. And so to be in that and to have that, what's gonna end up happening is to, to make sure that that stays on, it's gonna challenge anything that's inside of us. Because when we say I'm going to serve, it's gonna take whose power? God's, right? So then you have to go to God, you humble yourself as a servant and say, what would you have me do? And uh, Lord, I need your power to do this. So you got to go before him, these two things. If she takes th that off, she can go and do amazing things. All in her own strength. People do it all the time. You know, she could start a company. She could do all kinds of stuff. I don't need God. I don't need God for any of that. Then you don't have God's blessing and your heart's not being changed. You're just doing what you can do when you can do it. But when she's saying, I want to come over to how the kingdom works, I'm going to apron up in this humility. I'm going to come over to how he thinks by serving. So this is what happens. Um, is um, any of our insecurities, any of the stuff that we aproned up with, and I, I, I would have bought a pacifier, but I was like, that's going too far. I mean, you can suck your thumb if you want. But um, <laughs> but any case... So we go into servanthood in our, in our lack. Now, when a child is born, uh, they come from complete surrounding blood flow. All life comes from their mother and from God generating that. It's like there's, they're all taken care of. Then as soon as they come out, all of a sudden they're aware their little arms are doing this little flailing thing because they're aware we are in a cold world. And then you wrap them up in the blanket and they, they want to have that structure. They want to, to have that like, okay, so I'm safe. They need to hear the mother's heartbeat, right? That's why they always put the baby on the mother's chest. So there's a peace that comes. And sometimes other people can try to give the baby that and the baby ain't having it because it's like, that's not my mom's heartbeat. Sorry, I'm out. <laughs> they know. So there's that being tied to the mother. Well, it's the same thing in Christianity. Um, we're born again. So out of God, whew, here we are. And we've come out, and it's kind of scary. And we have our ways of, of taking care of ourselves and our ways of trying to stay close, and we don't feel that we can uh, think outside of this right here, all of our tensions on ourselves to begin with. As he begins to change our heart, though, he begins a process of any areas that she held on to, any areas that gave her comfort, any areas that she sustains herself, God will wean you from that. Yeah. But he won't wean you if you take the apron off. Because there's no need to. Yeah. Then you can... Yeah. I'm taking care of myself. They call it uh, self... Um, self-satiating 
is a way, you know, when a baby sucks their thumb, it's a way of going, I don't know where mom is, but, you know, I'll take care of myself, right? My blanket's with me, so I'm safe. You know, Bobo Bear is with me, so I'm safe. And then, and then, you know, and it's, but we still are really reliant. Someone's going to change the diaper. Someone's going to do it. And all the focus is on me. But when you change that, when you come to Christ and you put that apron on, suddenly God's going to start weaning you. And he's going to say, today, we're going to be without the pacifier during the day. You can have it tonight, but not today. Yeah. Yeah. And there's this, this it's trauma. When you do that with a child, anybody, it's, it's like, where is it? You know, and, and it's life-threatening in their mind. And that's how it feels to us when we come before God and we say, I'm excited, I want to serve. And you apron in, and if you keep that apron on, it's going to bring up this stuff. And one thing at a time, you can go ahead and sit down. One thing at a time, he's going to want to wean you from. Now, as you mature in God, we'll probably talk about this next week, um, there's a pruning process where you come in and there's that where he just cuts things out of your life. When you first start out, he's going to wean those things. And most of those things are emotionally based. When you put the apron on, most of those are emotionally based. Let's turn to Psalms 131, uh, verse 3. Well, we'll just read 1, 2, and 3 because it's... All that's in that, 131. <laughs> Lord, my heart is not haughty, nor my eyes lofty. Neither do I exercise myself in matters too great or th in things too wonderful for me. Surely I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with his mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me, ceased from fretting. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forward. And so, like a weaned child, um, the word hope there means trust. Trust is the only thing we have uh, when we don't know the will of God, when we're not sure where we're going. We have to then put out that trust that says, I still said I was going to serve, so I'm going to show up. Yeah, but what if it goes bad? I don't know. I'm, I said I was going to serve, so I'm still going to show up. I'm still going to be in worship. I'm still going to love him. I'm still going to read the word. Yeah, but you don't know where this is going. You don't know the will of God. You haven't, this hasn't been unfolded. Yeah, but I'm still going to serve. I'm not taking this apron off. Amen. Sorry, yeah. not going to do it. Not going to do it when the doctor says you probably should. Not going to do it when your psychiatrist says that. I mean, it doesn't really matter. It's like, now I'm still, in some facet, I am going to serve and I'm going to humble myself under the mighty hand of God, is what we talked about last week, um, to be under that hand of love, which is total prospering. Yeah. Love coming to where our lack is, is prosperity. And then he brings us up into that. And hope means trust. Trust is the only thing we have when we don't know the will of God. Uh, Psalms 37, 5 says, The Lord says to commit your way unto him. Why? Because it's the only way he can perform his will in your life when you trust in him. So there has to be a commitment that says, Apron up. I'm committed. I'm committed to serve you with all my heart, my soul, my mind. I'm, I am here. I'm here. I'm here. Yeah, but what about, you know, how your back hurts? I'm here. What about how this is going on? I'm here. I mean, what about those feelings of insecurity? I'm here. It'll come up like that. Um, so what he wants to do is wean the mind. Your spirit doesn't need to be weaned. It's a new creation, right? So you're not going to wean anything from that because there's no lack in it. We're just trying to get this, where the Holy Spirit dwells, to come over into this. See that? And so as soon as it touches this, we go like this. Because this is how we self-satiate. This is our comfort. This is why, you know, we hold on to earthly things or uh, emotional things. Because there's a part of us that will literally start fretting. Now, um, he says here, surely I've calmed and quieted my soul, like a weaned child with his mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me, ceased from fretting. Now the word fret means you're agitated, inner turmoil, upset, uptight, or bothered. There's a sign of poverty in the soul. You're fretting. 
Or we'll use words like, I dread going to work today. <sighs> Why? You signed up for this job. Ah, you know, the boss is probably going to say this, and then, and then I have to be up at this time. And uh, We're fretting. There's an anxiety. There's a, there, there's, you're either in the will of God, and you're supposed to be at that job and learn to rejoice in it, yeah. or get out of the job yeah. and serve somewhere else. Yeah. We're all meant to serve, yeah. right? So the first thing we have to do is lock into, are we in the will of God? And trust then that when that's disclosed to us, I'm exactly where I should be, even though it stinks, there's some things I don't like about it, uh, but I'm gonna walk through this. And when you're walking through that kind of fire, you've got your apron on, it's gonna come up. And then God's gonna say, I'll help you through this, but I need your blanket. Yeah. What, my blanket? You know, we had a little boy in our daycare, we did a long time of daycare, I don't know if it's 15, 16 years or whatever, but we um, had a little boy that, he loved his blanket so much and it had a, had a satin area around the outside of it and it, that he wore the blanket out and all that was left was pieces of the satin. So he would keep that in his pocket and he called that my piece. And I've always thought about that, you know, a piece, this is a piece of blanket, but I'm like, that really was his piece. And, and he'd go, if he lost it or whatever, you know, and a little piece of blanket in a daycare is like, oh my goodness, find it. <laughs> find that piece of blanket. Because he literally would lose it. Yeah. Like, lose it. <laughs> and he'd be crying and screaming and he'd be crying for his peace. Where's my peace? My peace. But see, when, when children are at home, they're not as separated from their parents. So they might not go through that right away. But as soon as they go into daycare, they got to take a big leap. Yeah. They're away from their main caregivers. And so that's when we do this even harder, right? And you gotta know and you gotta have, a lot of times kids are haulers, they'll you know, bring, I brought this toy and that toy today. Well, cause they wanna know that they brought something from home and now it's in the, in the daycare so they can look at it and go, home's with me. Yeah. See, it, it's just, it's important to them. And, uh, but as we're growing in God, if you use that same kind of illustration, it's, it's kind of like we can't be going, my peace, my peace, and looking in our pocket for something that we're holding on to. God will bring us through that servant area and he'll say, I know, I know you're upset. Let me prosper you so you're not agitated anymore, so yeah. you're not fretting, but I need your blanket. Yeah. Your blanket could be something you eat. I mean, it could be. It's like every noon I have a, you know, whatever, you know, whatever it is. And I got to have it or I can't make it through the day. Or every time I've got to have this certain thing, or I, you know, even a toothpick. Sometimes there's an anxiety and we'll chew on a toothpick and that becomes a habit. Wouldn't it be better to find out why we have that toothpick and what's at the base? What are we fretting? See? But see now, for another person to come up, if you've come under their authority, they might say, no blankets here. And then you have to adapt to that. Ugh, that's hard. It's actually better when God convicts you about something. Um, but rules in a place might say, no blankets, no teddy bears, no nuts. Want to work here? It, it might say that, and it's like, oh, I really want to serve. I really need this to work, but I don't know if I can do without these things. And whatever those things are in us, we all have them. But those are those, are those areas where we're satiating, we're taking care of ourselves. We're afraid. We're not totally convinced he's going to be there. And our poverty says, I better watch it. I'm just going to keep this here to make me feel safe. It doesn't make you safe, but it makes you feel safe, whatever it is. So fretting means you're agitated, you're inner turmoil, you're upset, you're uptight, you're bothered. So let's use that as a measurement right now. Is there anything in your life that you're agitated with, you're in turmoil over, you're uptight or you're bothered? Wow, oh, yeah, that can't be total poverty. There's always going to be something that bothers you. Really? Is there always something bothering God? Yeah, that's right. He's not bothered. He's not agitated. He's not fretting. He's total prosperity. He doesn't need to because there's no lack. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I shall not even be in want of anything. Amen. He's that kind of shepherd. So we go, well, if that's how it is, then why do I feel like this? It's to get that over to you. Yeah. To let the blessing truck run you over. 
That's what we need. It'll overtake your poverty. But he'll do it so graciously. Sometimes we don't even know necessarily what he's doing. All of a sudden, we'll just feel like he doesn't want me to do this anymore. I don't know why. Follow him. Because it might be something that's a crutch that's supporting you. And he wants you to walk on your own. <sighs> Pretty sure when Adam walked with him in the cool of the day, he would go, God, just a minute, I got to get my blanket and my nook. And I got to have this. And I'm going to bring my favorite toy. And I'm going to have because, I okay, I'm ready to go. And then walk and be looking around. There was no fret. They were, they were with God Almighty. Total peace and prosperity as they walk through there. Ah, man, that would be nice every single day. But the more we can get our spirit to connect in with God's ways and let that come out our soul, the more at peace you will be. And peace is shalom. And shalom means nothing's lacking, nothing left wanting, and nothing's broken. Ah, Jesus is the Prince of Peace kind of in charge of that when you're the prince yeah shalom now here's one of the rules about when the mind gets weaned uh well let's just say this the weaning of the mind there are things your mind believes it has to have to be happy or content there are things your mind believes your mind believes that you have to have to be happy or content if Fern doesn't change in a certain area, I will never be content. That's poverty thinking. But I believe that. I believe, say it again. If Fern doesn't change, no, say a little bit more forceful. You, no. Um, if he doesn't change in a certain area, if my belief is that uh, I'm up a crick. I mean, if he doesn't change in that area, there's no way I'll ever be content in life. Sorry, I don't get my contentment from him. I get it from God. It just feels like I need it from him. And so our mind believes that we have to have a certain thing to be happy. Prosperity of God, you can be in a prison about to be executed and you wonder how in the world these people just walk out there. They just walk out there. I'm picturing myself like, you're dragging me. I'm kicking you. I'm do you know, I just picture that sometime. Then I'm like, ah, oh, well, then you'd probably just have to face it and go out there. But you'd need some peace of God to have that happen. There would have to be some prosperity because if you let your lack come up, you're just going to go off all jacked up. <laughs> and you're going to get killed either way, but it won't be as peaceful than just facing it and doing that. So there are things your mind believes it has to have to be happy or content. And weaning the mind is a way, uh, is weaning yourself away from those ingrained dependencies that you think you have to have. So he weans our mind. He's the God who calls it. Like you could have got away with something last year. You could get away with your blanket last year, but not this year. This might be the year he's like, give me a blanket. What? You let me have it for two years. It's my peace. <laughs> it's my blankie. It's a, well, what are you doing? I mean, and we have to know that that's a process and be knowing that this goes on throughout Christianity. We think if we get rid of a couple big things, there ain't anything else there. We're immature. Yeah. Be perfect as my Father in heaven is perfect means be mature. He's calling us be mature. Yeah. Come up into maturity. Maturity is prosperity thinking. You have something traumatic happen to you. Let me tell you, you are reaching for stuff to calm your soul. I've had some traumatic things. You'll either take a route of like, I need to gather stuff around me. I've had foster kids who you come in and you try to find them and all of their teddy bears and everything, every blanket, every pillow in the house, they're under there somewhere. But they sleep like that because that's what makes them feel like they're safe. It's almost like being back in the womb. Right? Try to take that away from them. And I say, whoa, their soul needs that. Well, there's a time to let that happen. And then eventually we have to grow out of that. And it's the same thing with us where God will wean us. 
where we have those ingrained dependencies that we think we have to have. And to be weaned means no more fretting. So I can take your pacifier away. If you're two, if you're one, if you're eight months old, whatever your belief system is, and I, I take that away, and that's something that you felt that you were dependent on, I, it can be a week later, and you're still crying for it. You know, you, you think, oh, kids, forget it, but then they get agitated, and there's, it comes out other ways, and you're like, oh, no, they're doing fine without their pacifier. If they become dependent on something, yeah, now, now we can have trouble. Um, it's going to have to, they're going to have to grow out of that. It's the same thing with us. We can give something up. It's the longer we get away from it is the more weaned we are. And when it's final, no more fretting. Like I'm pretty sure, I have to say this this way, I'm hoping, pretty sure that if I offered everybody a free nook this morning, pacifier, then none of you would get too excited about it. Don't let me know if you would, but let's just go with that first thought, okay? <laughs> that you, you, you wouldn't get all excited about it because there's that feeling that you just know, I don't fret about that, I don't need that. I don't need that. You might need your cigarette, though. You might not be able to talk to people without a Starbucks cup in your hand. Yeah, it's like, you've gone too far. Yeah, we can talk about kids stuff, right? We, we don't need this, we don't need whatever. Um, but it's true that if you find an area, it's not whether or not, like, say, coffee is wrong or right, it's the motive. Yeah. It's what's going on inside of you. Why do we need that? It's amazing. Uh, it's amazing what you'll reach out for when you're in trauma. And I've had everything from muscle spasms in the middle of the night that will send you through the roof, and you're like, you know, your husband's like, what do you want me to do, you know? Touch me, don't touch me, you know, and you're, and you're trying to get, and some of you ladies know what I'm talking about. You take more vitamins, do some different things to get, but when you're in that, it's the end of the world. I mean, it's like, <gasps> you're trying to breathe through that, trying to get through that. It's amazing what your soul will want to reach out to. And I have to say, shut up. In the middle of the pain and go over to what the spirit would say. Oh, goodness. If you're going through something financially where they're like, if you don't do this by next week, you're losing your house. <gasps> you will start groping for things. If you, if you pay attention to yourself, you'll be that person like I've talked about before who will walk through the kitchen 15 times and look in the fridge over and over while you're trying to problem solve this. And you're looking. You don't know what's in there, but some, one time when you open it, something amazing is going to appear. <laughs> your soul is looking. It's searching for that blanket because we feel so out of sorts. And at that point, it's best to just look down and go, oh, that's right, I have my apron on. I am here to serve, and I will drop to my knees and humble myself before you, Lord God. Show me. Yeah. I will let you wean from me whatever you want to wean from me, but show me your character and your will and your ways. Prosper me. Amen. Prosper me out of this fear prosper me out of that so that if something painful is happening something tragic is happening you can be that person who will stand there and you're not unloving you're not unloving i mean um think about this there's people who are trained um in the er you know sometimes in the er my sister's a, a charge nurse and uh, you can have a person sitting there trying to hold what's left of their finger back onto their <laughs> other finger, and they're there for half, half an hour, someone else is having a seizure, there's something going on all around you, and you gotta call things. You, gotta work. you don't start out like that, you know what I'm talking about. You don't start out like that, but suddenly you have to come up to a place where you can't bow to fear, and you have to call what's happening and get that to go. Well, does that mean that person's unloving? They're so unloving, they're so, no, they're in charge. That's how he wants us to be. So that we're not falling apart over everything. And we're not crying out for our blanket. If we cry out for anything, it's God and his mercy and his love and his prosperity. Come and overtake me in this area. I need help. But we're not necessarily fully aware how blanketed or teddy bared we are until a tragedy comes. That's what we were always saying about America. We're like, oh, Lord, help us. One big moment of something, all the blankies are coming out. 
right? And it's like the, everything's gonna be, you're gonna see some really immature stuff. We have, we have seen a lot of immature stuff because that's how, you know, my violence is gonna protect me. That's a blanket. My attitude, my gossip, my what, it's gonna protect me right now because we're going through this tragedy. And so I'm gonna have to, I mean, these are all things that we use instead of being at peace and allowing God to prosper us. Oh my goodness, right? A weaned mind also does not have to know why. Think about when you take a child's blanket away. Now maybe you've never done that and had that fun time or whatever, you know? Or they can't have their teddy because it got ruined in the wash machine or whatever it is that was, was their thing. It's not fun. And they will, so that's the big question. Whether they're old enough to ask the question or they ask it through crying, laying on the floor, they're asking you, why, why, why? Where is it, why? But a weaned mind doesn't have to know why. We just don't do that anymore. I don't know, God just asked me not to do that anymore, so I don't. So in some sense, like when I bring up coffee, and you say, oh, too far, because that's a cool joke, but at the same time, when I bring that up, I don't have to prove and go through. I mean, I'm a natural health consultant. I can go through all the side effects of something like that when you're intaking it at a heavy rate. Having a cup of coffee every couple of days is pretty all right, all right for most people. But to be intaking it as much as our society is taking, not all right with the amount of sugar and all. And I could prove it and I could show you all the different things that are happening. You don't care. Most people don't care. Um, and so, I, the, and it's not my job to wean you. I'm just using that as an example. To wean you from something. I can give education or whatever, but you have to go before God and say, God, should I be drinking coffee this often? Yeah. Just using that as an example. And if he's going to wean something, he'll do it. But it's for your prosperity. It's not, oh, man, now i got to do without this. And you start fretting. Well, when you first get weaned, you fret a lot. And, and you fret more than even when you have the items, because they're not there. And what will happen many times is if we're not careful, we'll replace it with something else. I lost one teddy bear, then I found another one, bigger one. Be hard to lose this one. Got a big old one. And, um, and then or we'll start collecting all the different things. And, and even the, the sucking of the thumb is that um, self-soothing is what they call that. And babies do that. They put their hands in their mouth or whatever because their, their uh, brain is just starting to really kick in where their five senses are starting to happen and they can feel. And it's kind of like, okay, there's somebody here soothing me even though mom and dad aren't here soothing me. Somebody's here soothing me. Well, that's fine when you're in that stage, but eventually, got to pull that out. Yeah. Right? Well, then who's going to soothe you? Your soul is convinced that you have to be dependent on something. It's convinced we need to be dependent on God and his power. But it's very difficult to stay aproned up to serve and have this stuff come up. And you're like, ah, and God starts weaning you. And you're trying to focus on your serving while he's trying to wean you from something else. And, you know, and then we get this picture in the church almost like you'll see somebody serving or somebody, let's say myself even, being up here because I'm behind the pulpit. You know, we're on YouTube. Blah, 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 you know, and, and it's just like, oh, they just, they just know how to serve. How do you know I didn't have a blanket yesterday that had to go? It has to go at the same time I'm serving. It's very difficult then to, you know, say, I'm not taking this apron off no matter what. Well, no matter what comes up. And that's where in church we have to grace each other to be like, well, they're being weaned in that area. Yep. Rather than, I don't know, I saw Susan's blanket. I'm not sure she should be serving. Now, there are some things that you need to step back. You know, it's a, a bigger gun things or maybe willful sin or something like that. We need to step back. But let's grace each other because we're being weaned. And some of us are in spots where we, we're being pruned. Certain things aren't producing in our life and God's saying, and now's the day we're going to cut that branch off. <gasps> Why today? It hurts. But pruning is easier if you've already been weaned because you know what it feels like to let go. See, if you've already been weaned, you know what it feels like to let go of something. 
But if we begin to be like that magnet and we're gathering and we're gathering and we're gathering, I'm here to serve. It's kind of hard to serve when you got all this in your hands. Kind of hard to balance where you're going and see what's going on when all of this is here. We got to let go. Yeah. And so he's so gracious. One thing at a time. A baby's not born and, you know, you give them three, you got three months to pull it together. <laughs> You're not going to have a blanket or nothing after that. You know, he's not like that. He knows what we've been through too. And he knows the degree of our lack. So maybe I have a high degree of lack in one area and you have that same area, but yours looks like this. I'm going to go through a little bit more pain because I probably have more things that I'm dependent on to help that area. Yeah. So grace, yeah. grace, yeah. grace to each other. And grace brings prosperity. Grace and favor. Favor is like we're God's favorites. And what does he want to do with his favorites? He wants to pour on his grace, and that brings prosperity. It's like a magnet to the good things of God. And do we deserve it? Absolutely not. That's what makes it rock. That's what's so awesome, where we just go back, that's my dad. That is my dad. And so well, the more we see that, the more trusting we are, instead of going, all right, I took all the pacifiers and threw them out. You know, parents will do that. Like, did it when they were sleeping. You know, <laughs> today is going to be a long day. You know, whatever. And we prepare ourselves for that. You reach a point um, where maybe it's not done that way. Maybe it's done like, Susan, I need the bear. And you're like, Right? You might be two years old inside and you have to go, here, Dad. Maybe. Here. <laughs> but could I just have it? No. I need the bear. There is a point where he will bring us to where we ourselves will grow to a place where we go, here's the bear, Dad. And then sometimes, in certain areas, I have had it where it's like, I found out I had a blanket. God didn't say anything to me. I'm like, oh, I am so giving this to my father. I found this this morning. Yeah. It's in the closet in the back just in case. But I pulled it out, and I don't need this. Here, Dad. Yeah. I found my old blanket. Yeah. Well, thank you, Mary. And he'll take that. That's the exchange yeah. from poverty to prosperity. So if you say, well, I don't believe in the prosperity message, you are in big trouble because it's not a money message. No. Yeah. It affects your money. It's a healing of your soul. Lord, my, ha my heart, this is the point he came to, is not haughty, nor my eyes lofty. How come? Because he explains it in a little bit here. Neither do I exercise myself in matters too great or things too wonderful for me. So he has a measurement of where he's at. Surely I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with his mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me, ceased from fretting. So remember I said last week, once you know you can't not know, I say that so many times. So now you know this sermon and this, this right? I'd say I'm sorry, but I'm not because if you are presently being weaned and you didn't know it, now you know. If you're not presently being weaned, good chance you're about to be weaned. <laughs> Love me, hate me, whatever. This is what he told me to say. And so, so there is that thing, though, that says we prayed. I mean, Dean has prayed several times here, and God has given him scripture on prosperity, both financially, emotionally, all those different things. And we've put our faith toward that. So we asked for the blessing truck to run us over. So it's too late. We already put that in motion. So you can't be like, wait, wait. In your poverty, grab your stuff like, I, could you wait? I don't want to be run over. No, the blessing truck's coming. And when it hits up against what you're dependent on, here, Dad, here you go. Don't need my brain no more. Right? I'm a big girl. And then he will grow you into that. Right? This is why sometimes when children fall down, they, they, they will cry for their blanket. Now, don't get upset with me, but now think about this as parents. 
This is a side thing. There is a point where you have to make sure your child is weaned or they will learn dependency on things. So like the little boy, peace, my peace, or whatever, he had that peace till he was seven. Okay, that's too, that's, you know. He doesn't, he should have been getting something from his parents, something there. And so what that says is, okay, later on, wasn't that cute that he had that little blanket, that little piece or whatever? Yeah, well, when he was 16, what about alcohol? My piece. So we really have to go, you know, let the child go through some of the crying and some of the things that have to be. And if they're dependent on anybody, they should turn to you. Mom, help me. Mom, pray for me. And you turn them to God. We're going to pray to Jesus right now. That's what we're going to do. See, so all your dependency turns over. There's a time and a place, and each child has gone through different things, so it's not a law, it's not a whatever. But what I'm trying to say is just pay attention to that. Pay attention. And sometimes when we're not allowed anything, it creates such a big need, as they've been proving that too, that as you're not allowed anything, you know, buck it up and tough it up and all that kind of stuff, that eventually children will reach out for things too because they didn't get what they needed to feel safe until they grew to that point. And now they're reaching out to things they shouldn't be reaching out to as an adult. See? Pornography, the base of pornography goes back to nurturing. If you were properly nurtured. There's other reasons that it can, you know, really catch you. You can just get addicted by looking at it enough to get your brain addicted. But the base of why we turn to those things many times is this. Person's not an evil, wicked person. They just got a blanket. And God wants to prosper you out of that. Let's stand this morning. The Lord says to commit, this is Psalms 37, 5, to commit your ways unto him. Why? Because it's the only way he can perform his will in your life when you trust him. So that's that commit. And then we say part of our commitment is I'm here to serve, Lord. Lord of the harvest, I'm here to serve. Thank you for setting up your kingdom in my heart. I'm showing up for duty. I'm here to serve. Put that apron on pretty tight. Tie it in a knot if you have to because all of your things that are here are going to say, get rid of that apron. You don't need to serve. Servanthood goes outward. These go inward. It's about me. So part of him, he uses that as a tool, servanthood, to get us to grow and to mature and to prosper us. That's the seed time and harvest in it. He wants us to come up to be able to serve. And as we serve, we're planting that seed, but we're not planting it for us. We're planting it in other people. And it matures us because we'll get weaned in the process. We'll get pruned in the process and we will produce. And who gets to eat first of the harvest? but the laborer. Hallelujah. Father, we just praise you and we thank you. We thank you for the weaning process. We thank you, Lord God, that we're clothing up with your apron and, and that you're showing us, how do you want me to serve, Lord God? I want to serve you from me to you, but I also want to do some things. I want, I want to help in the nursery. I want to help greet people. Whatever it is, put me in a spot where I can serve so I can mature. And then, Lord God, whatever needs to be weaned, Dad, yeah. you make that call. Amen. And Holy Spirit, you counsel us through it. Just like mom. Just like mom. And we will give up the blankets and we will give over the things yeah. so our total dependency is on you. Do this super on the natural in our hearts right now. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. How many of you know that you're being weaned of something right now? Okay, that, that just shows we have a halfway healthy church. I'm just being honest. Because there's always something God will be weaning you of. All you have to do to find out, well, I don't know, he's not working on many, get an apron on once. Come over to the weaning area. Put your apron on. Let's work together. While I'm being weaned and you're being weaned. And we have our little crabby times and stuff like that. God loves you and he wants to prosper you. 
And this is how he's going to do it. As we humble ourselves and apron up and we give these things away. It's better to me to have a child say, here's my blanket, then give me your blanket. Some, sometimes I just go around looking for something to give up. Because <laughs> before I get asked, I might as well just get it going. It's easier that way. But he still always finds something that he has to say. Come here. You ever walk through your house just as a, a cleaning uh, thing before the Lord? Because, you know, you're the guard of your home. You have, to, you have to know what comes in and out of your house. Have you ever walked through your house and just said, God, is there anything here that doesn't belong? What in this house does not please you? And if you know for sure it doesn't please him, please don't give it to somebody else. <laughs> somebody one time brought all this demonic, like I don't remember if it was dragons and sorcerers or whatever, and they're like, I'm giving it up, but you can give it to anyone in the church you want because I'm just letting it go. <laughs> Actually, I know you spent a lot of money on it, but it should go in the garbage. Go through your movies. Look through the different things. And don't do it legalistically. Ask the Spirit. Is there something in here that I'm relying on for my comfort, for my entertainment, for my something that satiates me so I feel safe? And let them speak to your heart and get it gone.